With that being I'm said, on it. it's time to get to the most exciting streaming release from the past week. It's not Saltburn. It's Maestro from director and star Bradley Cooper. His second directorial effort following A Star is Born. He's swinging for the fences here, Ricky Flex. He has had the long, elusive Oscar. He wants it bad. He wants it through potentially a directorial effort, a starring effort. Let's get into the Rotten Tomatoes, the IMDb and synopsis, and then we hunker down. So Rotten Tomatoes, Maestro is clocking in at an 80% critic score and a 73% audience score. IMDb clocking in at 6.9 out of 10. And the synopsis reads, Maestro is a towering and fearless love story chronicling the lifelong relationship between Leonard Bernstein and Felicia Montalegra, Cone Bernstein. A love letter to life and art, Maestro at its core is an emotionally epic portrayal of family and love. There's your synopsis. Ricky Flex, high expectations here. Did it live up to them? I would say for the most part. For the most part, it did. I, I still, like my expectations was for A Star is Born, which I think, again, Bradley Cooper, I think, should have won Best Actor that year over Rami Malek. I think that movie is incredible. It's close to being unrewatchable, not because of because of uh, the cringeworthiness that we kind of kind of touched upon uh, last segment there. But overall, this movie is about the performances for me. I think it's an interesting story, but not as put together as I would have liked. That's kind of where the letdown happened for me. But the performances were as expected, if not better. And I think that these powerful performances is what carried this movie to being very, very good. So for me, like, yeah, it didn't meet those expectations. Um and it, but again, like as a complete and utter like complete story element to it, I don't think so. But not that far off. I agree with you. The best aspect of this movie is definitely the performances. And I'm having a hard time deciding who was better, which is kind of saying a lot because I thought Bradley Cooper was unreal. He transforms. He puts on the makeup. Right. He really becomes Lenny. And Carrie Mulligan is softer. She's more subdued. She looks more like Carrie Mulligan. But I'm wondering if this was more so her movie than actually Leonard Bernstein's movie rather than a Bradley Cooper's movie. Um, and it's tough. Is she, I got, like, and when I look at this title, Maestro, it's obviously about – it's referring to Leonard Bernstein. But it's also about this relationship and the sacrifices that his wife makes in order for him to be – and reach his potential – Right to have the hate leave his heart, as she likes to say, and for him to become the greatest composer that the world has ever known, right? Like at least for the 20th century, and someone that has been responsible for the likes of some of the greatest plays, some of the greatest movie scores of all time. I think it was arguably just as much about Carrie the Mulligan's character as Bradley Cooper's Leonard Bernstein. And and when it when I think about expectations. I did not anticipate that. You tried to warn me numerous times. You were like, hey, they're kind of campaigning Carrie Mulligan as like the lead of this movie. And I'm like, dude, it's called Maestro. If it was about her, it'd be called Maestra. But she kind of is a conductor of Leonard Bernstein's life in this movie. Without her, what is he going to be able to achieve? Definitely rides the backs of these two performances. The best parts, no doubt. Yeah, like the best parts would are... Mainly when, I won't say the, the best part, but the best parts for the most part is when they're on screen together and they're having those confrontations, those conversations, the outer lens where you see both of them. There's not a zoom in on each of their faces. And again, like you're right, like she kind of like Felicia would carry letter. Like she said numerous times throughout this movie, like you need me. You don't know how much you need me uh, to yeah. Lenny. And like, I think that's a part of the story in this movie as a whole is that this movie, the heart of this relationship is through her. And I think, it, was, it It is an interesting take. It's definitely not the normal, like, easier path that the, a, a music biopic would have gone, which is just narratively going step by step through in someone's career and then talking about some relationships along the way. No, Bradley Cooper took his spin on it, uh, focusing on the relationship. And again, like like I talked about and you, you mentioned, the poster of this movie, the main one, the first one that was released, it was with Carrie Mulligan. 
alone on it. Not a Bradley Cooper, even though this movie is about Leonard Bernstein and Maestro and is made because of that. And they kept targeting Carrie Mulligan for everything, all the interviews. And, and Bradley Cooper kept pushing off his name and saying, oh, we should talk about, be talking about Carrie Mulligan's performance and whatnot, right? How political that is, we'll see. But or we, could, we could debate. But all in all, like, yes, it's all about the performances and the chemistry between these two, which were off the charts, I think, in this movie. So Leonard Bernstein conducting and him performing, those make up like, oh, my God, those Oscar moments. Like, look at this performance. Look how much he is sweating. And look how hard he's working in these scenes. And I think Carrie Mulligan, she is more effortless in the performance, for sure. Like, Bradley Cooper is constantly talking over Carrie Mulligan in these scenes. He's talking over everyone he's talking to. He's a very magnetic personality. I think he portrays it well. And I think he just has to be more out there than a Carrie Mulligan. But I think she kind of is the soul of this movie. And like where this movie goes wrong, I think it's supposed to be more about Leonard Bernstein, right? And you're talking about the poster, but I mean, Leonard Bernstein is in the, almost every scene of this movie, right? There's only one real scene that I could think of that is solely Carrie Mulligan. And that's like her quote unquote Oscar moment here. But at the time, it's like exploring themes of love in their relationship, which makes sense because they're on screen together the entire time. But then it's talking about Lenny and his loneliness and him striving to be the best. I think you need the, it almost felt like Cooper couldn't decide like whether to make it more about the relationship or more about Lenny. You get a lot of like, like, a, like almost a passing over of some of the iconic moments of Leonard Bernstein's career, right? Whether it's the, the you children, do, for sure. like the children's specials, they glance over on the waterfront, they glance over West Side Story, they pass through it. And like the big moments aren't like, oh, look at him in the studio for West Side Story. It's him doing Mahler too at this English cathedral. Like, I don't know if that is like heralded as his best performance, but like, I felt like it didn't do exactly what biopics typically do, which is like, oh, here is the big moments. Like, like, like for example, Love and Mercy, like here is Brian Wilson conducting Good Vibrations. Like it doesn't give you that. Instead, it uses the score of some of his most famous works in carefully places them throughout like important moments of his life you know i just felt like it's non-traditional in that aspect but at the same time like it, it it was all about kind of his relationship with carrie mulligan's character and it was less about the title of the goddamn movie does that make sense like the, like just two different directions here this is yeah it's as an audience member looking for entertainment we want to see more of him conducting like they skip over his famous first ever they tease us with his first ever uh, concert that he conducts. You know, he gets the phone call and he like, oh, um, I forget the guy's name, Burns or whatever. He's sick. Um, you need to go and conduct at the age of 25, right? And we, they tease us by getting to the podium and he puts his arms up and then they black the screen's black and then it's the end already. They always skipped it and that was, you know, one of the most important moments in – music history really in the 20, uh, 20th century um and they skipped obviously west side story and you, you mentioned all the other things they skipped and a normal music biopic you know they would have touched it ridley scott would have touched on all of these moments you yeah. know going back to napoleon he would have easily touched them yeah they're juicy and as an audience member we want to see those juicy moments we want to see um the biopic the uh, who's it about at their best in their prime and at their peak and here yes we see it once but he's still on the older side. Like, what if we got to see, like, three different times of him conducting? Once when he was young, perfect timing, his first ever time, him taking over basically this er this industry, then in the middle or maybe off to the side, like, doing his composing with was a, something a little different, maybe not conducting, and something that's really influential, or maybe working, uh, like, with the children, right, on the TV, on TV. Or, and then, I, then we get at the end with him teaching and also with the resurrection scene so i think there's a way where you could have incorporated yes the heart of this story why we're doing this is the relationship between him and felicia but we still could have did those like magic moments you know the money makers yeah. how we like you know where we get that extra money uh why you're a superstar that's what we need, missed in this movie and i think it's still a very good movie it's just that's why it's not going to be best picture over oppenheimer i i just don't see that what we needed because like there was this huge conversation between Felicia and Lenny 
saying and Felicia saying you have hate in your heart, right? You need me. And then eventually some time passes and then it goes to the Mahler 2 scene. The one scene that everyone's talking about, the six minute sequence where Bradley Cooper is going crazy, right? The one that he trained six years to do and he replicated Leonard Bernstein. An absolutely jaw dropping moment. But I think where it fails is directorially where it's this moment happens and it's supposed to be a payoff. How much he recognizes that Felicia meant a lot to him. And at this point, what's been established is they've been estranged. They're not together at this moment. Like there, it does not pack a punch like Bradley Cooper thinks that moment to me is a YouTube scene. That's a YouTube moment. You look it up. We did it with our family this week with the, during the holidays. I'm like, yeah, you don't have to watch like, maestro but you can watch the Mahler 2 scene at the cathedral in england like that is worth it like it's a it's a youtube moment it's an oscar moment right but there is no moment before that there's a build up right he's on the outs he doesn't believe in himself and then he has this moment it kind of just happens and that's where i think the movie goes wrong there is no like that's supposed to be the big game the big moment and it doesn't seem like it's building up to that it's just like something that happened does that make sense that was my biggest gripe of this movie. And I did rewatch this movie. So I've seen it twice now. Just to see, like, maybe I'm wrong about this. So, like, in the first act, I think we might defer on this. I like the first act. I, I think I'm, I did like it, and it moved quickly. Had some very cool transitions, some quick cuts, editing, the cinematography. Like, all in the first act was very, like, very cool. Um, the movie was shot on film. Um, the guy that did A Star is Born... Uh, with Matt, with Bradley Cooper is again with him here. That cinematographer Matthew like Lebatique, I don't know how to pronounce it, but like I was just like that's Hollywood, baby. Like that is it, and like the editing makes the narrative plot more thrilling throughout that first act. And then we get to the second act, and we start getting hints of like, oh, this marriage might not be working as well. The first time I watched it, I didn't pick up on them as like as core. Like I obviously picked up on them; they were slapping me in the face, but. I didn't pick up all the subtle things. The second time, I definitely did. But that part, what you just mentioned, with the resurrection scene, they split up, and then all of a sudden, they're back together again. That, they never sold on me, both times. And I think that's a key directorial and writing mistake um, in this movie, where there was no tease, uh, even on a second rewatch. There was no, nothing subtly or nothing that slapped me in the face that said, oh, obviously, they're getting back together. No, there was nothing. The only thing that was possibly that you could say that to was when the Carrie Mulligan scene, the, like the only scene without Lenny, uh, Leonard Bernstein, was when she was like, oh, I tried to go on a date and that guy was gay. Like, I have a type. Like, yeah. oh, am I supposed to decipher that she goes back to him? No, I don't think so. And if that's what it is, that's just a mistake on their part. So I think that's like the big thing for me is what you said, narratively speaking. Like, it just didn't put it all together. Yeah. So Sell me. that Mahler 2 moment, in the cathedral, it's kind of the end of the second act rather than the beginning of the third act. It it's like the final act, it's the final scene of the second act, and then she's diagnosed with like cancer. And for me, I actually like the third act a lot. I don't know what it was. I liked the family together, and I think it helped like the audience understand that this is such an unorthodox love story. This is a man, a closeted homosexual, gets married. His wife has this understanding that he right? Enjoys the company of men, but she understands that she's going to have to make sacrifices for him in order for him to be great. And that's where I think the third act makes sense, where he has to make sacrifices for her to keep his family together and to care for her. I thought that worked actually pretty well. And I got to admit, we're talking about these two performances, Bradley Cooper and Carrie Mulligan, but you know what I thought was really good was Maya Hawk. And she I didn't even good. know was, she was in this movie. I thought she was excellent in that scene, that one-on-one with Leonard Bernstein, where she's hearing rumors about her father and his homosexuality, and he has to lie to her face, and then she has to kind of know behind those lying eyes what, what's actually going down. I thought she was really good in this movie, and this like kind of showed me she's more than just Stranger Things. She's more than a cameo in one than one in Once Upon a Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Like I actually thought, like, hey, like she can turn out to be something special if she is kind of like the third person I think of behind two like heavyweight Oscar performances. But uh, overall, I did like the third act. To me, the issue is that is that this performance did not mean anything narratively. 
It just happened, you know? Yeah, I think overall, like with the family in the third act, I did like. And my aunt, like good, you good, like building the resume, another good year for her. You know, once upon a time in Hollywood, you know, very small role, but Tarantino, uh, she gets to be uh, Stranger Things, that little breakout moment there, being a supporting role. And then Asteroid City this year, Asteroid City being the teacher, and now this. And then I think she's going to be in a movie uh, starring with Ethan Hawke, her dad directing so i think she's making like for the resume builder this has been another good year for her and i'm excited to see like in three years time where she is dude sarah Sil- sarah silverman in this movie i also didn't see coming um i thought it was really weird in the party sequence where they just like made made sure she had hard nipples <laughs> did you see that i honestly didn't even notice but i made a note immediately i said why are her nipples so hard <laughs> but did you not think she was okay? I thought she was okay. I thought she was okay. You know, I kind of like that. Like she's at the la- latter stages here, trying to push herself a little bit, go outside her comfort zone. I like that. Like I, when I hear Sarah Silverman, I think of School Rock. That's literally what I think of. That is crazy. I, I honestly think of uh, Saving uh, Silver, uh, Saving Silverman, the movie. Yeah, but that wasn't her, right? Like she no, was, it wasn't. Yeah. Um, who was that? Who was that chick? That I don't know. Jason Biggs was with that. I don't know. Yeah, him and Steve Zahn, right? Google. Neil Diamond. Neil Diamond. It's something short. It's like Egg or something. Last yeah, it's name. It's taken forever. Two thousand one. Of course, uh, the first three names. It's she's not on it. Wow. Guess the Rotten Tomato score of Saving Silverman. Sixteen percent. Wow. Eighteen percent. Yeah. Stay hot. Um, this is uh, just taking forever. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, your internet's getting a little hazy right now. Um, so where do I want to go next? Amanda Pete. Amanda Pete. I knew Egg Pete, whatever, something like that. Where I want to go next? Technicals below the category. This movie was shot amazingly well. Like I wrote down, this might be the best shot movie of the year. Like. And something is kind of hurts with it has a long range conversations. So you don't capture the emotions as well with some of these characters. I felt like Bradley Cooper was kind of flexing, you know, throughout this movie. It's not only look at me as an actor, look at me as a director, look at these angles I could put together, look at the black and white in the first act. We can capture like these this moonstruck love story, and then all these colors burst in the second act and get into a more complicated marriage. Um, You have the amazing opening sequence, tribute to old Hollywood. You got the one track camera going over the top and you have this explosion. You got the big Hollywood drums going at the same time. Gave me some mank vibes, to be honest. But it felt like uh, below the line, Cooper was kind of flexing saying like, yo, you saw me in A Star is Born. I'm leveling up here. And I think that almost was like a part of the movie I didn't like. I just felt like he was doing it for show. You know, just like the performance sometimes was for show, like, look at this moment, look at that moment, and look what I'm doing with this camera, rather than making sure it fits into the story. But uh, any other thoughts on, like, below-the-line categories here? I think you're right. It's just like, hey, look at me, look at this, I can do this. This is why I I made those comments saying, like, I might not act anymore. Like, I might just become a director. And it's him just trying to prove himself in his second-ever feature it. film. And also, we have to remember, he also was a co-writer on this. Him and Josh Singer. So, and Singer won an Oscar for Spotlight, also was a part of First Man, and that, Damien Chazelle, and that relates to what I thought, not Mank, but Babylon, that first act. I thought a lot of Babylon. Uh, just the odes to Hollywood, trying to sing the ac- Academy's praises. I don't know. I, I felt a little Oscar It is like, ba- it's more Babylon than Mank. That's a good call. That's just for me. And again, the Singer in it, element of it all, I think also helps with that. But, you can't like now I understand like after seeing this like why like Spielberg was supposed to do this project but after seeing a star is born told Bradley Cooper that he should do this I understand now I think they picked the right person for it and not just the star but also direct I just think narratively speaking like and it's shocking because Josh Singer obviously spotlight one of the better movies of the 2010s I don't know I going back to what we were saying before it just didn't put all the pieces together for me unlike the technicals which I think did do everything that they had to do. I was also thinking about Bradley Cooper as a director and similar to a star is born where like overall, I really like a star is born, 
but Bradley Cooper as a director makes some decisions that I think are in poor taste or they are just odd. For example, Star is Born, the part I, I, I can't get past is him pissing himself at the award show. Yep. Same. Like, it's why did you do that? This is way over the top, right? You didn't have to go this far for a movie that is supposed to be, uh, it's not a comedy. Like, like, uh, like, to embarrass a character to that level, I never understood. And it's one of my least, I thought it kind of spoiled the movie, right? It's just like, why did you do that? To me, it's just a head scratching decision. And just like here, he kind of still can't avoid those odd choices, like the shout, like needle drop at the end of this movie, him taking advantage of like his students. I'm like, why did we have to do this? Like you're showing him in this third act caring for his wife. And then you see him like after this great scene of him as a teacher, him as an instructor, and you kind of tear him down in that moment. I'm like, damn, did you have to do that? Was he known for that? And then he also has some really corny moments like him pulling up for an instructing lesson with these kids and he's playing uh, like the REM song, song, It's the End of the World as we know it, and it's going Leonard Bernstein, which is like a great song and a great, like, what's what that's, I, I think audiences recognize that moment. Even if you don't know Leonard Bernstein's work, it's like, oh, look at him in pop culture, what he means. Like, he didn't have to tell us that. Like, come on. And then there's a license plate that says Maestro. It's like those head scratching moments, I think he has to get rid of to be taken a little bit more seriously. I thought it was a terrible choice in the third act. Yeah, as you says, those cringe moments, like, ah, or like awkward moments, eye rolling moments. Yeah, like, why? Oh, come on. Like, why'd you do that? Things like that. <laughs> um, it's the same thing. Star Wars more in that pissing sink. God, I'll never get over that. That is literally like. The, one of the main reasons why I don't revisit Star Wars. It's like one of the perfect. It, it's all. It's nearly like a perfect movie if you get rid of that scene. <sighs> it's so sad. Um, but not just the movie, that scene. But overall, like you're right. But if you know, I, I'm on and I'm on your side. But if I had to do a spin zone or take I'm on your side, if I had to do a devil's advocate or Miracle. whatever, other side of this, I would say, you know what, Leonard Bernstein throughout the whole movie, he kept saying he loves people. But he loves to be the center of attention. He loves to say, I am the best. I am a god. Uh, there's a scene I was I was, I was uh, listening to an interview uh, before this pod with Bradley Cooper. And he was saying even the first scene that we see, which is Bradley Cooper, he found out, Bradley Cooper was saying how he found out that Le- uh, Leonard Bernstein was living, literally actually living in Carnegie Hall, like up top, the roof of whatever, Carnegie Hall. And he, that's how he got the phone call. And he was saying how, Bradley Cooper wanted to make it like it was God coming down to his music, yeah, like with the music, right? Like, oh, we're like God, Leonard Bernstein is coming down to do his first performance and we're going to be able to listen to him. And it's just like, yeah, he thought he was God. You know, he thought he was like above us, you know? And that's kind of like, I guess the- He's a cocky dude, dude. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So I think like, oh, my name's in this hit song. I am a maestro. I drive this. I have all these fancy houses. I can take- like over all these classes and say, I could literally do this in my sleep. And like, I don't know. I just feel like he was that type type of person. He was trying to show that I didn't like it. I'm just taking this other point of view here. I I do, do want to say he didn't come off well in social situations. I think Bradley Cooper, if if that was his message, like, Hey, this guy, he's a magnet of like popularity. People always want to be around him, but also like Lenny understood that like, People want to hear from him, and he didn't really consider other people's opinions. I think that got him in trouble with his wife a lot. But every conversation he has at a party in a social situation, he's talking over somebody. Like, he is on top of them, will not let them finish a sentence. He won't even let his wife finish a sentence in a fight. And that kind of brings me to my next uh, point of conversation here. And we talk about, like, iconic moments of this movie. Like, we talk about the Mahler 2 scene. Um, I think another one is the moment where he he's quote unquote coming out to his uh, wife or his fiance at the time uh, in the play sequence where Bradley Cooper jumps into the play. But I think another Oscar moment moment from this movie is when he's having the debate at the Macy's Day Parade with the backdrop of Snoopy going out in the background. That conversation I thought was dumb. <laughs> I just like they are speaking so heavily in undertones and they're not addressing the elephant in the room it pissed me off like you're not just talking about your husband is gay and he's hooking up with dudes and he's not hanging around the family 
They're just dancing around it nonstop. And all she says is you have no love in your heart. It is filled with hate. I'm like, can we just be straightforward? Can we not be so cryptic about this? And I know you're trying to flex the writing chops here, but let's just address elephants in the room. Cause I felt like they were just dancing around the obvious in this movie at points with the dialogue. If I, if I had to say another weakness of this movie, I think that line, you have hate in your heart or whatever, that's a BS line. What is the point? <laughs> like, dude, just say like, oh, this is a self-pretentious prick, self, uh, self-centered. self Like, this guy, like, he he wants everything to be about himself. It's hard to live with. That's why you kind of left him. Not just because, of, and like, you want to say it's not just because you have this understanding where he's gay slash bisexual or whatever. It's also, and not spending time with the family. It's also because he's terrible to be, to live with, to be around. And he's just a party pooper, even though he's supposed, everyone loves him, right? Um, No one really sees for who he is. Egomaniac. That, yeah, egomaniac. And to say hate in his heart, like, doesn't really show that, even though the whole movie shows everything else. Because, honestly, like, he loves, he kept saying he loves people. Obviously, people love him outside his family. I just think the hate in his heart, like, I don't, I just think that's a good line. And that's kind of like, if you had to think of one line in this movie, that's, like, what you're supposed to come out of. And I don't think that's uh, necessarily accurate for what we saw. So, I totally agree with you. Um, to kind of spin it again, I would say that, like, scene in the Thanksgiving Day Parade. Um, I would agree with you. They were kind of teeter- teetering a little bit too much on the outskirts of what was actually crucial. But it is, again, I like that frame when they do that wide shot instead of, like, the zoom in on the people because you see them still together. And it's just like you see them, like, the fighting together and, like, what it is in real life. And I think it was also not necessarily an Oscar moment, but kind of an Oscar moment for Carrie Mulligan as well for that scene, too, you know, taking charge and being on the front foot. You know, so yeah. I did like that as well, because, again, like we said, she's kind of the heart of the movie. Oh, the, don't get it like uh, twisted here. They acted their asses off in that scene. Yeah. Like like that was the highlight of the movie. That's like one of the best scenes, like Bradley Cooper and Carrie Mulligan, just like going Nothing. at each other, not letting each other finish each other's sentences. The movie had been boiling to a head between with their relationship in the second act. That was like a, the right moment. It's just like what they're talking about. It's like what? Like, can we just like talk like in plain English here? Like to me, it was just ridiculous. Uh, but it was well acted, and that's where the movie shines. And uh, Bradley Cooper, absolutely on another level of those conducting scenes. Like this movie is worth watching, right? Like the way we're talking about it, we have some cr- like criticisms about it because we know it could have been great. The expectations. It could have it, it been. It's like. Obviously, you're going to get the nominations for performances here, the below line categories. I'm not, I don't think this is going to get nominated for Best Picture. I, I'll say that. Really? I, I, I don't know. I don't think so, man. It, like, it's, it has everything else, which is weird. It's got the acting lead, male, female. It's got the below the line. It's got the sound. It's got the cinematography, but the writing stinks. <laughs> like, I think it kind of stinks, Ricky. I, I won't say it stinks, but it's not – it's it's, it's not average. to the same level. Yeah, it's not at the same level of everything else. The acting, the below-the-line technicals. I think there's no way this doesn't get nominated for Best Picture. I want that on the record. Like, okay. I want that on the record. This is getting nominated for Best Picture because of everything that we said. Like, yeah, sure, the writing might be good, but, like, there's 10 nominees now. Like, guaranteed 10. This The day and age of, like, Whoa. eight or six is over. 10, and you're telling me this Bradley Cooper produced by Steven Spielberg and Martin Scorsese. Yeah. Spielberg, who was supposed to be doing this, who literally went to Bradley Cooper and said, you'd be better at this than me after seeing uh, A Star Is Born. And uh, like we said, we were praising this movie at the end of the day mo- more than not. So this is getting nominated for Best Picture. Yeah, I don't, but would you put it in your that. top 10 movies of the year? Just just curious. Would you put it in your personal top 10? No, probably not. But not the it's not that far away. If, you know what I'm saying? It would probably be top 20. I think it's a contender for sure, like for top 10 of the year, like whether it sneaks in in that top 10. But um, I see what you're saying, and you're making a convincing argument. If you get nominated in all these categories, like that's enough, right? They're right. like, well, you can't fault one downfall of the movie, one one negative aspect of the movie, or one trait of the movie that doesn't reach the heights of the other. You know, I'm sure you can say that about a bunch of movies that are being nominated for Best Picture. Uh, let's get to scores. What do you give Maestro? Yeah, at the end of the day, this is, a gr- this is a good movie. Yes, the writing holds it back for me and some just narrative choices. Uh, and they're like major problems. But like at the end of the day, like this is still a really good movie. I highly recommend people watching it. 
I'm I'm actually with Rotten Tomatoes. I gave this an 80. Okay, I'm a 75. It's a it's a 7.5 out of 10 for me. It's I it is it is must watch. I'll put that tag on it. Bradley Cooper, second directorial effort, two powerhouse performances. That's enough. That should not stop you from seeing this movie. Um, I'm with you, Ricky Flicks. 